Thanks, Igor. Okay, well, uh, good to see you all here. And we're going to have a hell of a time here. Um, we're going to tame the beast that is C, as you can see in the picture that I've chosen for this talk. Um, because, well, sometimes we have to work with C programs, and sometimes we, uh, uh, we need their, its strength. But we, we are Pythonistas, right? So we want to keep using Python as much as possible. And this is something that I'm personally very interested in. And how can, how can we uh, use Python for, for a, a lot of things, but still uh, uh, keep things neat and simple and uh, also um, use as much external software as possible. And in particular, my interest is in embedding Python. So um, let's get started. So a little bit about me. Um, my name is Emil Doer, and I am an uh, uh, I have an indie uh, app development company called Codel. Um, I mostly do Mac and iOS work and occasional consulting, and that's where my Python interest comes in. I have a blog at codel.com/blog, and I will post a supplementary article in the next uh, week or so uh, about this talk. So if you want to know more. Uh, about the, uh, the in-depth stuff, then uh, go check it out in a few days. But this talk's going to be mostly about CFFI. And um, CFFI is basically the, uh, the thing that makes uh, um, working with C and PyPy uh, so very powerful. Now CFFI is, um, it stands for a C foreign function interface. A foreign function interface basically means it's a library that can be used to talk to something else, something that's foreign, not Python, basically. And um, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about its history, because uh, CFFI was built uh, because of necessity. Because um, originally there was already something that, um, that you could use to communicate with C programs or any other programs um, uh, from within Python, and that is the C types library. Um, but also, um, there's of course in Python itself the ability to make C extensions. And that's all, uh, that's all very cool and it, it works quite well. Um, but along came PyPy, and PyPy is Python written in Python. Um, but at some point you still had to you know, deal with, I don't know, hardware or external uh, libraries or whatever. So there was still some kind of need to, um, uh, to, to let this software interact with each other. And um, because Python, PyPy is completely written in Python, or our Python, if you've seen my last year's talk, um, you know that uh, C, Python is not C. So something had to be invented to, uh, to, to build this bridge. And this is where CFFI started. Um, so CFFI basically is uh, a Python package that allows Python code to communicate with uh, non-Python code uh, by means of uh, uh, loading libraries and accessing functions and stuff that's in this library. Um, and the goal of this project was actually to not just be able to do this, but also to be able to do this with um, the uh, uh, without introducing any intermediate language or uh, or a, a domain-specific API. So. Just Python and as much as close to the original APIs that you're trying to access as possible. Now, there's a lot of work uh, already done in this field, and that's uh, with the LuaJet project. Now, the LuaJet project has an FFI library that is actually really, really, really good, and it's really well written. It has a clean API. So, um, Armin Rigo, the guy who, uh, who started this, uh, this uh, CFFI project, thought like, okay, this is a good, good uh, basis to start my, uh, my work on. So uh, um, what you'll see if you explore the, the code of CFFI and if you take a look at LuaJIT FFI, you see that they are, very, they are very comparable. And this is a good thing. So CFFI works on both C, Python, and PyPy, which means is very interesting because this means that any code that I'm going to show you for the rest of this presentation will work both on C, Python, and on PyPy. Now, for accessing uh, regular uh, um, uh, library functions, this is not very exciting. However, uh, we're also going to talk about embedding, and that's where it gets really cool, because embedding with PyPy was previously not possible, because PyPy doesn't have a C, in, uh, a, C uh, a way of writing C extensions and stuff like that. So, with CFFI, this will become possible, and I will show you in, uh, in a few moments. Also, it works on both Python 2 and 3, which is fantastic. 
So how does CFFI actually work? Um, well, you start with a bunch of Python and of course a bit of existing C code that you want to call. And for my examples here, I will be um, uh, showing a, uh, I will be assuming that there is an, uh, an existing library which I will call libfoobar, just for example's sake, uh, and it has some kind of function foo which takes an argument and returns an argument. Um, and um, what we want to do is we want to call this function from Python, but it is not Python, so that's where CFFI comes into play. And the most simplest way of doing this is as follows. So here you have the most minimal code uh, required to use CFFI to call um, a function inside this library. And it basically boils down to uh, opening the library and calling the function. But you have to tell CFFI first what kind of function you wish to call, because um, functions have arguments and return uh, values, and they have types. And um, of course, these have to be translated to Python objects and, uh, and back again, of course, um, so that uh, we can uh, use the values uh, in, in Python itself. And this is what CFFI does, but you have to provide it, as I do in uh, lines 5 to 7, uh, you have to provide the function prototype of the, uh, of the function that you want to call in the library. And most of the times this is really simple to do, because this basically boils down to uh, copying the function prototype that is in the header file that uh, belongs to the library, um, just copying it there, and then CFFI will parse this and it will exactly understand, like, okay, um, this, uh, this is a function that takes, in this example, an integer, returns an integer. And um, under the hood there's some magic happening, uh, so that in line 11, when you call it, it's basically treated as a Python function, and the, um, the, the translation is, is after opening and, and defining these things, is seamless. So the top part you have to do only once, and then afterwards you can just treat lib in line 9 as a package, basically. And from then on you can just basically do, do anything with it, uh, like you would do with a regular Python package. Except the only thing is, you're now calling C code, which is awesome. Because now you can call your favorite audio library or whatever you want to do. Okay, so this is the most simple example. Um, there, it has a few downsides though. The most important one being that um, in lines 5 to 7 you see that there's a bit of parsing going on. So if you, do, if you do this stuff a lot in your Python program, you will have to constantly parse these header files. And if you're like using a very, very big library, um, then these header files might become big and there's a lot of parsing time involved and this, this becomes slow. So um, there's a mechanism to move this parsing out of line. And that's done as follows. You see that this example is actually quite similar, but what I do here is I, instead of calling uh, the DL open and the FFI uh, or, and, and the, uh, the food function itself, I'm basically moving this parsing to a separate script. So this is a separate Python file which just calls ffi.compile if it's called. And what this does is it produces a Python file called under example.py. And this contains pre-processed data which is uh, easier to import and does not uh, uh, involve any parsing anymore. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like. So this is the file that is produced. Now for our simple uh, foo function, there's not a lot of data, but you can imagine that if you're importing like, I don't know, a big big library um, with lots of functions and lots of types in their structs and you name it, that this file will be pretty huge. But importing this is, is really simple because they're just byte strings and that hardly takes any time. So this is a great performance improvement and this is, this is the way you should use it if you're going to use something like this in production. And, and using this now becomes even more simple because now we just import this package and we still have to open the library of course and uh, point to the correct uh, path and all that stuff and now we can, um, we can uh, uh, just uh, call it. There's one difference here is, and that is that uh, when using this approach you're importing at the ABI level so you have to make sure that ma manually that the types are correct. So in this case we're casting our argument one two three to a C integer. Um, this is this is still bad, and uh, there is also a solution for this problem. But I will explain to you first why this is bad, because um, 
If you uh, consider different architectures, uh, then uh, the size of an integer might be different, and you're not really sure what, uh, what to expect here. So, um, if you use like a pre-processed uh, um, uh, Python module here, then there might be some place where it says like, okay, yeah, um, this function assumes a 32-bit argument, while on your machine it's actually compiled a 64-bit. Uh, you might run into these problems, so um, this is why this approach generally does not work if you want to make your code portable. So there's, a, there's another solution. Now it gets a bit more code, um, because I have to show you a bit more complicated example to, to demonstrate what I mean here. Um, so this is actually something that's coming out of, uh, out of the standard library. Um, we have a function get pwuid. Um, which basically returns a struct password for a given user uh, identification number on a Unix system. And um, we see here that this struct has a, uh, character, uh, a, a, a character pointer of pw under name, and uh, that's the field that we're interesting, interested in. Um, but we also see something interesting here, and that is the, uh, the triple dots on line 13. And that's not just because I removed code or anything, this is actually a feature of CFFI, and you can basically tell CFFI like, okay, I don't care about the rest. Uh, just uh, make sure that I can access this field and um, the rest doesn't matter. And the nice thing be uh, that, that, happens be uh, uh, that happens here is that CFFI will figure out where the position is in, in the struct of this, uh, uh, of, of this, uh, this field and it will automatically generate the correct um, uh, Python code for accessing it, no matter what the system. So, so you're saying that pw name doesn't have to be the first field? Exactly, okay. yes. This, uh, there's a pre-processing step happening, and it, it figures out where it is, and the, the, the triple dots uh, basically say, like, you figure it out. That's the idea. Now, there's another difference when you do this approach with uh, 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 if you do it like this, because now the generated file is actually not a, um, a Python module, but it is a Python C extension, uh, which you can then compile, and uh, this C extension does, uh, is, is directly linked to your specific architecture. But the, the point here is that the C extension should be compiled on your target machine where you can generate this script wherever you want. So that's, that, that's where it becomes uh, portable. Now using it, is still the same, except we don't have to do this cast anymore. So this is this is really really powerful. It just looks like uh, whatever you want to do. There's still something, um, some conversion going on with the ffi dot string. That's because uh, C strings and Python strings can be interpreted differently because of Unicode and all that stuff. Um, but I won't go into the specifics uh, for that here. I will say though that CFFI is absolutely wonderfully documented in my opinion. So um, if, you, if you want to know more about the, the depths of it, I can really, really encourage you to read the documentation because it's, it's just well written and it's, it's very easy to understand with lots of examples. Actually, most of my examples are from the documentation, so I have to give credit for that anyway. But now we go to the interesting part of the talk. This, I've given you an overview of CFI and how you can use it, but we've currently only talked about um, you know, calling existing C code. But the thing I'm interested in personally is always how to do the opposite. Like suppose you have a program already and you want to extend this program with Python. Um, how would you do that? Well, with C Python, which I will call here the old way, um, there's, uh, there's something you can do. You can use the C, the C Python C API and basically from your C program you can start an interpreter. And in this interpreter, you can then uh, execute code and all that stuff, and then clean up a bunch, uh, and then you're done. Um, and there's there's a pretty nice API for it. Um, it's a lot of work to get things uh, get things going, but there basically is a solution, and it, it, it works. So here are the three steps that you need to do to uh, to use the, the C Python API for embedding. Basically, initializing, then running your code, and then cleaning up. Um, but Actually, step two is kind of involved because you have to do something uh, with, with Py objects. Py objects are basically what Python objects are uh, when they are represented in C. So it's, it's like, it's, 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 um, 
basically an opaque struct with reference counting and all that stuff, and you have to make sure that uh, mm, that when you get uh, get something from a Python function, that you also uh, manipulate the reference count to, to make sure that things are cleaned up properly, or otherwise you get memory leaks and all that stuff. And um, while this is still, it's quite it's quite a clean API, but it, it's still a lot of work. Code will grow tremendously um, if you're constantly converting arguments from Python and, and back to C and all that stuff, uh, and, and and in reverse. So yeah, headaches. Um, so, it would be nice if there was a better embedding API. Now, there's another thing, and I, I mentioned a few minutes ago C Python, but this talk is, of course, about PyPy. Um, we want to embed PyPy in our own in our own C programs, and uh, there there used to be no way of embedding PyPy yet uh, until recently, since uh, PyPy five, because. Um, PyPy 5 introduced uh, a, a new version of CFFI that it was bundled with, and this, this one has an embedding approach, and I will show this uh, in the next few slides. But basically, there, there's no PyPy C API, so that's why, in the, with, with the old way, you could not embed, um, embed PyPy uh, in, into, into your program. So let's talk about the CFFI way of embedding. Um, this is uh, it's quite elegant because um, the way of embedding code with CFI actually looks a lot like what you've seen in the previous slides. And it's not a lot of code to do uh, that you have to write, and it's also not a lot of uh, complicated C stuff that you have to do, which is really, really nice. Because, you know, the more you have to do with memory management and all that stuff, the more headaches you get. And you, you would like to, to prevent that if you can. So the way this goes is, you have a Python generator script, which is basically like the function, uh, like the script that I've showed before with the uh, ffi.compile. So um, you basically put your C code in there and your Python code. You say, okay, compile this to something, and and then we can start executing this. And and this something is actually a dynamic library. So. CFFI has the capability of transforming your own Python code into a dynamic library, which you can then uh, load in your C program or in whatever program, and you can access your Python code as if it were C functions. And all this translation of arguments and all that stuff gets done automatically. And this is really powerful, because the, the amount of code that you have to write is, is becoming much less, and I will, I will show you. So the steps of, um, of uh, using your own Python uh, dynamic library in C are pretty simple. You open a dynamic library, you import some symbols from the library, these are basically C functions uh, from the perspective of your own program, and then you execute these and uh, do whatever you want with the arguments or whatever. But here's where it becomes really interesting, because step one and two can be performed by the linker for your own C program. So if you just supply the proper arguments to uh, a GCC or Clang or whatever you're using, you basically have only your function to execute, and then you're done. Assuming you uh, you define a prototype somewhere, but that's that's basically the only thing you have to do. You have to do, um, and that's great. That's even less work for us. So let's do this. Now here's. Um, Here's an example uh, that, that uh, produces a, uh, a dynamic library. Um, it involves uh, a couple of steps. Now, first of all, we have to declare what our C API is going to be. Now, for this example, I'm going to uh, make a library that just uh, exposes an add function. It takes two integers and it returns an integer and this result is just the, uh, the sum of the two. So um, in line six, you see the C prototype, and this is actually the thing you have to define in your C program if you want to use it, um, and nothing more. And um, then in, blocks, uh, in, in, in the code block between line nine and 16, you can see the Python code that is used to, uh, uh, to provide this function. Now, one thing that's kind of peculiar here is that this, this code is actually uh, placed in a uh, doc string here, and um, uh, 
this this is kind of an ugly pattern, I think, that with with CFFI, and then especially if your your uh, code is growing and growing and growing, then you see that uh, that you will have lots of lots of strings there. But of course, you can read this from a from another Python file, and uh, and then it's done. And, and and I would encourage you to do so because if you do this, then you can also write tests around it and all that stuff. So your code becomes very clean again. But for the sake of simplicity, I will uh, I will just show it the way it's provided in documentation of CFFI. Um, so there are some things going on here. Uh, first of all, you just have in line 13 the uh, the add function. Well, everybody here understands Python, so you know this is trivial. Um, we print a little message to uh, uh, help us uh, with debugging later to see what's actually going on behind the scenes. So when we run this, we would expect uh, that we uh, that we see this ad at such and such. And uh, there's something else you have to do in line 12. You have to say like, okay, uh, we define this function as an external function. And this basically tells CFFI that this particular function will be matched to a function prototype given in the uh, in the previous uh, block in line six. And, um, and and when there and the match is found, then this will be exported in the library. So this this is useful because uh, you don't want all your functions to be exported in your library. For example, if you have helper function or something in C, you would just say static, and it's uh, not not exposed anywhere. But Python does not have such a construct. So see if I introduce something to explicitly say like, okay, you may export this. There are, there are some other directives that are also related to this, but I won't go into the details there. Okay, so, uh, and then once again, with line 18, we say like, okay, we want to produce a uh, dynamic library called under example, um, and we compile this. Now, that's great. Um, we, when we run this, we have our, uh, our dynamic library. Now we want to use it, so for that, we need a C program. So here's a C program, and as you can see, when I compile this properly, there's almost no work you have to do to call Python code. Like, the only thing you have to do is define a prototype, and then in line six, you see immediately at the start of main that we can call it as if it were a C function. But behind the scenes, it's Python. And all the stuff of starting up the interpreter and converting the arguments and converting the return value back, it's all done automatically, which is awesome. So, if you don't like C, Use PyPy instead now. <laughs> so okay, but but this is this is the example, and um, yeah, we would still like to see it working. And of course, we still have to know like how how do we produce something that actually works? And that's actually really simple. It just takes two commands. So first of all, we call this uh, this embedding generator script, uh, the, the the Python script that I showed. Um, it produces a bunch of output. And uh, it produces the under example dot dylib or dot so if you're on Linux. And um, now using uh, using Clang or GCC or whatever you prefer, um, you compile your C file and you provide the library, and um, you can do that in whatever way you like. And then you call it, and well, the expected result is C. So that's great. So now we basically have. Uh, our own C program, and we've extended it with Python. But now I want to go one step further, but I will only touch, I will only scratch the surface here because this is really advanced, and um, my blog post that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk will go more in depth, uh, where I will be writing a plugin for Audacity, the audio processing package, purely in PyPy. Um, but here I'm going to provide you an overview of what we're going to do. So. Um, Suppose you have uh, a piece of C code or a, a piece of software that you have not written yourself, and it's maybe it's even only provided in binary form or whatever. Uh, and this pro this program has some kind of plugin interface in which it loads a C library and uh, expects some kind of function to be there and calls it and then basically uses that to extend its own functionality such as the uh, Audacity plugins that I just mentioned, but there are, there are many programs using plugins, and it, it basically all works the same. Now, the cool thing is here that we basically don't have to do a lot else. The only thing I'm going to show you now is that um, uh, the, uh, the C program that actually loads an external, um, 
uh, an external library written in Python. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an application that basically loads a plugin that expects this plugin to have an app function. Now this is for the sake of efficiency because we've already written this plugin uh, in a few slides before. So uh, we can just assume that the plugin API is exactly the same as the, uh, the dynamic library that we just wrote. So in that case, it just becomes like this. And the C program, in this case, will just open this library uh, dynamically, and this can be done via GUI or whatever you prefer. Um, you would have to then load the symbol and, and then execute it once again the same way as we did before and clean up afterwards. And uh, what you see here in lines 5, 7, and 14 is basically what the linker does for you when you compile it into your own program. But uh, a plugin uh, or a program that uses plugins does not know about the existence of the plugin at compile time, so it has to do this on runtime. So even there, there are only a few more steps to start using PyPy in your own C program. So with that, that's uh, the end of my talk. And um, what I've shown you here is that CPI, uh, or, or CFFI is actually really powerful, it's really clean, it's very stable, it just works like magic. So if you're ever going to work with C, uh, uh, external C code or you want to uh, put Python in your, uh, your own uh, C program or maybe even other languages, I would strongly recommend the CFFI way because it, it is just terrific. Thank you. So all you showed were calling functions that took integers, yes. passing integers back and forth. Yeah. What about more complicated types like a class or a, some, a string, uh, something that's got allocated memory? Because I believe that, uh, first of all, how you define those classes so that they're exposed to C, and second, um, what is the memory management uh, regime like? Because I know that PyPy is garbage collected and exposing the internals of your C program to the PyPy garbage collector would be very complicated yes. indeed. This is an excellent question, um, because the CFFI guys solved this problem, basically. Um, what they did is you have, uh, for more complicated objects, like say, uh, say you have structs that, that you have to allocate, um, they, they also have an allocation mechanism, and uh, they convert uh, this allocated stuff to reference counting inside the, uh, inside the Python runtime. So basically, you never have to free stuff that you allocate. Uh, the thing is also, uh, you, you might get allocated memory back uh, from C. Uh, you would have to treat that the same way as you would with C. And there's also a mechanism to free that manually if you need to, but um, that's also sorted. And things like classes, um, I haven't really looked into the de in depth of uh, exposing classes to C, but I know that for, for very complicated data types, like even like function pointers and all that stuff, there's conversion uh, mechanics uh, uh, presence. So I would assume that a lot of these things would be possible. Uh, so uh, uh, Python integers are a superset of, uh, of C integers. So what happened? How do you deal with them not matching? Um, I'm not exactly sure, actually. Um, I haven't really explored the, uh, the the boundaries of that uh, that topic myself, but I know that they're um, uh, that uh, making sure that uh, that you use this C extension stuff will make things just just work basically. And they focus a lot of attention on making things work with the least amount of, uh, of, uh, of work for the programmers. And that's really the, the the power behind CFI that you don't really have to worry as much about the types because that's frustrating. Do you know if it's possible to embed more than one PyPy interpreter? For example, using a dialog with RTLD local to get no simple clashes and just load two plugins that are written in Python in one program, maybe in two different threads. Yeah. Would this work? Um, I think, well, with threads it's not a problem. Uh, this, this imported stuff is thread safe. Uh, there is also a gill inside there. Um, but I have not looked into loading two, uh, two dynamic libraries simultaneously. I would assume it would work and they would spin up their own interpreter. 
Um, there is a library used behind the scenes, so it might happen that this library gets only loaded once and um, makes sure that it just works. I, but this, I haven't looked into this, but I, I think it's possible. And it is also possible with the C Python C API where you can spin up sub interpreters. So I would ex I would expect that they've also tried to solve this problem too. One last question from anyone? I was wondering about one thing myself. You had this example with uh, adding two inches, right? I mean, yeah. if this would be a normal C program, it would run really, really fast. Mm -hmm. But now you added this embedding of this interpreter, so it will start up a some JIT uh, environment and the uh, whole setup. So how, I was wondering about memory and CPU time. You, can you say, is it fast? Uh, does it take a lot of time? Well, if you donate to the PyPy project, it gets faster. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. But uh, no, I can't say something about this, uh, because there is, of course, spin-up time for the, uh, for, for the interpreter, and you will always have this. Um, however, uh, the thing is, this happens only once. So if you call this add function 20 times, you only have one interpreter being spun up, and it will only be terminated when uh, the library is released. So in, in that sense, um, if, if what you're doing in Python is actually just the bulk of the work, then it doesn't, you don't really have to care about the, uh, the spin up time. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is always something, you know, if you're using another language with, an, with, a, virtual, or with a, a virtual machine or whatever, you have to start it, you have to allocate memory for it, this will not change. But it is one of the things you have to think about when, uh, when you decide whether or not to use Python for such a thing. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks a lot, give everyone a an applause and uh, let's lunch outside.